Most of us watch big games on television. Our favorite basketball, baseball, or football teams go head to head in the playoffs, and we're riveted to the screen when everything is on the line. But how does it feel to play the big game? What is it like to be the one on the free throw line with no time on the clock? What are the Olympic athletes thinking about right before they confront their moments of truth? On television, it can all seem somewhat removed, and this is especially true with chess, because typically chess books don't discuss feeling nearly as much as moves, variations, transpositions. From afar, it all seems like a sterile environment. Two chess players sitting across from a board, thinking, making moves. But in reality, the tension of chess competition is wild. In championship play, there are always people watching, whispering, pointing. There is always noise because the silence of 300 rustling people is the loudest silence in the world. Television cameras follow the top players while they penetrate impossible complexities, and a fan shatters the thought process by asking for an autograph just when you are on the verge of the solution. And something unexpected always happens. Once in a world championship in India, there was an earthquake during the time pressure, and all the lights went out. We kept right on playing because leaving the board would have cost the game. There wasn't any time. When the impossible concentration of deeply immersed thinkers is snapped, it's like being dumped in freezing water. Can you regain composure in time? And you can always count on the biggest distractions when everything is on the line. And much of what we're going to focus on in this course is how to deal with the unexpected. How to keep on flowing when everything is falling apart. How to win the big game. I was actually inspired to write this course by a chess master programming whiz named John Merlino while we sat watching a critical game in the Super Nationals in 2001. John had worked on chess master for years, but had never seen high stakes chess in person. He was awed by the tension and potential distractions that the competitors had to deal with. I've been wrestling with these things my whole life, so I was fascinated by how it all looked to someone seeing it for the first time and John actually suggested that I discuss how to deal with these elements of competition in the program, and I think it was a wonderful idea, as the psychology of competition and the potential learning process that can result has for years been a focus of mine. So if you enjoy this course, send a thanks to John, as he gave me a solid kick in the right direction. Our first game in this course was played in the seventh round of the 1995 U.S. Championship, and was a battle of teacher and pupil. Kaidanov and I had done a lot of work on the theme of maintaining the tension, and then we went head-to-head -head in our very topic of discussion. White is temporarily up a pawn, but this doesn't really matter. Black's going to win it back. What's critical is how to improve one's position. A lot of players have the mistaken idea that when you're up material, or much better in a position, it means that you can just mow the other guy right over. To the contrary, what having a better game usually means is that your position can handle the mounting pressure more effectively than your opponent's. Patience and embracing the struggle are key to converting such minimal advantages, but emotionally it's very hard to resist grasping for the win instead of letting it come to you as the position organically unfolds. This type of game is the bread and butter of great technicians like Anatoly Karpov. Against masters of the positional squeeze, the smallest disadvantage can feel like the suffocating vice grip of a python. As we play through this game, I want you to try to feel the tension. So whenever I ask you what you think is the best move, hit pause and decide what you really would do. Then after a few minutes, continue with my discussion. If you really struggle with the game, you'll learn much more. White to play, what would you do? So when I said that it didn't really matter the white was up a pawn, of course I wasn't talking about all chess positions. In a lot of games, the smallest material advantage can be decisive. But in this one, my extra pawn is doubled. My d4 and d5 pawns sort of repeat themselves, and my d5 pawn is so weak that in time it will inevitably fall. Black will be able to win it. The key to my transforming my material advantage into a stable positional advantage is going to be how I choose to give back the pawn. And that's much of my edge here, because I can make that decision. When I asked you what you would do with white, maybe your inclination was to figure out how to attack, how to go. Maybe not. I'm not sure. A lot of players feel that when they're winning or when they're better, that they can just rush ahead. But in this position, we have to gradually improve. This game is one in which the tension, as I described before, will increasingly get larger and larger, more difficult to bear, and the person who can stay separate from that mounting tension internally, who can just continue to improve their game, will have the advantage. My first move was very simple. Rook AC1. Now we know that black's plan is going to be to win the d5 pawn, and since I left the a-file and left all potential for pressure on the a5 pawn, Gregory played rook c8, improving his rook as well. He also is planning to play bishop back to b8. His rook is in the game, he can bring his bishop back out of the line of fire and open up the d-file's pressure on my d5 pawn. After rook c8, what would you do? I kept to the spirit of gradually mounting the pressure. Rook fe1, just developing. Now he played bishop b8, his plan. Now what would you do with white? The 
It's very important when you study this position, and as I go through my discussion of how both players felt, that you really try to find the moves when I ask you to, because otherwise you won't feel the difficulty in the finding of the moves. In this position, I asked you how would you improve, and if you really tried to find it, I'm sure you had a hard time figuring out what to do. All of your pieces are placed in a very logical position, and it's simply very difficult to decide how to make things better. This is easier said than done. Your first instinct might be to try to find a way to run forward. We can't do that. My opponent was too strong. He didn't allow for anything like that. Next, you might want to improve one of your pieces, which was obviously what I wanted to do. Knight a4 would be the logical way to do this. With the idea of him playing knight c5, pressuring his queen side, hitting the b7 pawn. That would be a very good square. After knight a4, he can't take on d5, because after knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, queen takes d5. If he tries to play rook takes c1, just notice I have the in-between move, bishop takes f7, check, followed by recapturing, and I've won a pawn. And after queen takes d5, knight b6, I have a fork and I win the exchange. The problem with knight a4 isn't that it leaves the d5 point, but that it leaves the d6 point. It turns out, actually, that in the game, Gregory thought that I should have played knight a4. Let's look at why I didn't. After knight a4, queen d6, his next move wants to be bishop g4 or bishop e4, pressuring my f3 point, exposing my h2 weakness. He wants to take on f3, take on h2, and try to get a mating attack. After queen d6, I have two choices. I can either play g3 or knight c5. g3 tries to stop all of his attack. He can't play bishop g4, bishop e4, or he can, but it doesn't make any difference now because he has no more exposure onto my h2 point. But then what he would do is simply say queen f6. He's caused me to weaken my game a little bit. My light squares are a little looser. And then he can play queen f6, go away, followed by rook fd8. He's made me compromise my position. In a positional game like this, all the little differences matter. If I play knight c5, b6, knight a4. My idea, of course, was to provoke the weakening move of b6. Now I'm pressuring that square. Bishop e4. Now my idea would be to play knight e5. Notice that I forced him to play b6, and now this point is a little weak. So after I give up the pawn, for example, after knight takes e5, d takes e5, queen takes e5, after I deal with the problem on h2 by playing f4 with tempo, his queen will move, say, to d6, and my next move will be knight takes b6. I win that pawn, and now black's in big trouble. So after knight e5, he can't take right away, but he can do something else. f6, attacking my knight with his pawn, forcing my knight to move away. If I play knight takes g6, what does black do? He plays queen takes h2 check, and I'm in big trouble. But of course, this wasn't my idea. What I had in mind was f4, solidifying my knight's position there, a temporary peace sacrifice. Now notice if he doesn't take it, my knight can move. When he does take it, f takes e5, d takes e5, my central pawns are tremendously strong. If black tries to simply move his queen away somewhere, leaving them there, his game will fall apart quickly. Say queen d8, after knight takes b6, attacking his rook, later what I can play is d6 check, my e and d pawns will steamroll him. Black will lose this game very quickly. So he would have to give back the piece quickly. After knight takes e5, f takes e5, queen takes e5, threatening mate on h2. And after g3, black to move. What is his best? In my analysis, the reason that I came to the conclusion that knight a4 wasn't, in fact, a good move is because in this position, black has the move b5. Otherwise, he'd be in trouble. I'm going to win the b6 pawn. His bishop and queen are lined up with my rook. It's always good in the abstract to have your rook lined up with the other guy's queen. His game is very loose. But after b5, things start to be different. He's undermining my game. And after bishop takes b5, otherwise it's a fork that'll lose a piece for me. Then my d5 pawn's going to hang. My center is going to get loose. I don't have that strong central bind anymore, and my king is going to start to get very, very airy. This position is not so good. So notice that was a very long, complicated variation. It's very important to remember that when we're making slow moves, like rook a c1, rook f e1, gradually improving our position, it's not because there aren't complications that are possible. It's that the complications don't quite work out yet. So again, in this position, we just said that if knight a4, a move that I could play, but that forces things just a little bit, after that long, complicated variation, things are good for black. It's not right for me to allow things to happen that way. I can improve my game, though, make it happen in the best way possible. As I've discussed in many of my annotated games, in many positions, we don't just have to think, what do we want to do, but what is my opponent's plan? What does he want to do? And then we can make a move that at once improves our position and prevents what he wants to do. I played h3. Now again, this isn't the most exciting move. This isn't the most aggressive thing to do. But in chess, aggression only works when the position calls for it, and you have to get ready for that. You have to prepare your game for the explosion. After h3, now that ball is in black's court, what can he do?
you can see that in all the variations, his possibility of playing either bishop e4 or bishop g4 is very helpful for him. I'm stopping the bishop g4 possibility. Right now my knight controls e4. I'm improving my game a little bit, but more than anything else, I'm asking him, what are you going to do? And now we see the title of the game, Cat and Mouse. In the introduction, I gave you the image of a cat and a mouse, how when a cat stalks a mouse, it sits in complete stillness and waits for the mouse to move. And when that twitch comes, the cat just leaps on it in the direction that the mouse has moved. And this is why they're such great hunters. You can feel a little of that in this little flurry. In this position, I had to figure out what to do. I wanted to move my knight, but instead I improved my position a little bit with h3. And it was Black's turn to figure out what to do. Gregory played queen d6, improving his game that way. Now remembering that what we want to do is improve our knight's position. The c3 knight is very important. White to play. This one's pretty logical. Knight b5 with tempo. We're improving our position, and because of the tension, my opponent allowed me to do it and gain some time to boot. After knight b5, he chose to play queen d8. He could have also tried queen f6, which might be a slightly better position for the queen, but he would give up pressure on the d5 point. He wanted to win the pawn. So notice the last couple moves here. We were back in this position, trying to decide what to do. Now what we have is this position. I gain two moves, and it's my move once more. This is what maintaining the tension does. If you can improve your position in the best way possible, your advantage will widen. Now after queen d8, I have a new set of problems. My d5 pawn is hanging. My knight has come more active, but it's not defending the d5 point. Remember I said in this particular game, all my material advantage really meant was that I would get to choose how to give it back. If he plays knight takes d5 next, then he has a very strong blockade of my d4 point. His knight is onto my bishop on e3. Black's game is very good. If he wants to, he can bring his knight on g6 back to e7 to solidify his bind on the d5 square. I don't like this position. But now is a critical moment. I can force my opponent into a little more awkwardness. I played d6. I rammed the pawn down his throat. His bishop on b8 is very uncomfortable. He can't go to a7, of course. He has to take the pawn. But after bishop d6, I have a nice tension on his bishop. And I play d5, and my pieces come alive. Suddenly my dark square bishop is slicing both queenside and kingside. Now it's even material, but I have a dangerous passed pawn on d5, and I have tension on his bishop on d6. In other words, I can take it whenever I want, and he can't take my knight with his bishop at all. So that's a situation which is to my advantage. If you look, on the other hand, at a typical pin, where, for example, if my queen were back on d1, pawn on h2, if he has bishop g4, my knight is pinned to my queen, and now his bishop has tension on my knight. My knight can't move because he'll take my queen, but that doesn't really matter. The point is that he can make the decision in all the tactics whether or not to take my knight. Returning to the game, in all the variations he'll have to analyze, my opponent's going to have to take into account that I can simply take his bishop. That's very, very uncomfortable. And plus, in open games like this one, bishops tend to be a little better than knights. And of course, I can take his bishop, queen takes, and then quickly jump into the same score with my other knight, knight d4 to b5, attacking his queen, and then trying to play d6. He has to watch out for that. Because of all these things hanging in the air, my opponent played bishop e4. He tried to trade down some pieces. This is a very logical thing to do. When you have a positional disadvantage, when you're being spatially squeezed, when all of your pieces are tangled with one another, when you need more room to maneuver, a good way to relieve the tension on your position is to trade down a couple trades and you'll have less pieces in this small amount of space. So bishop e4 has two ideas. One is to simply be able to take bishop takes f3, which will mess up my pawn structure if gg takes f3 and also alleviate some of the pressure on his spatial squeeze. But also he's threatening my d5 pawn. Do you see why? After a quick calculation, I'm sure you see that after knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, bishop takes d5, queen takes d5, I'm the one who's taken last. I have enough pieces defending. What's Black's idea there? He has the discovered attack, bishop h2 check. His queen opens up an attack on my queen, and after I take back, he takes on d5, and I've lost a queen, and I'm losing the game. So bishop e4 at once threatens my knight on f3 and opens up a discovered attack on d5. I should note that his other option of relieving the tension on his bishop with bishop b8 wouldn't be so good. Why? Because here I continue to push forward d6. And now you start to feel the black's game is in trouble. Both my bishops are slicing into his king side and queen side. My knight on b5 is ideally placed. My pawn on d6 stops all mobility of his dark square bishop and his queen. It's a dangerous pass pawn. Black's in trouble. This is why he chose to play bishop e4. Notice that his move is based on the idea of a discovery, of taking on d5 a lot of times and then having the discovered attack bishop h2 check. But also, after a move like bishop e4, your alarm bells as a chess player should go off. He's lined his bishop up with your rook. White to play. What do you do?
Here white has two good options. One is much more complicated than the other. One principle in converting a positional advantage, although I've said that you don't want to trade down, is to make the material unbalanced. From that perspective, if I could trade my dark square for his light square bishop, it would be good for me. Now, that might seem like a strange comment, but let's figure out why. Let's take them off. Now, it looks like his bishop on d6 is very good, and my bishop on c4 is biting on my d5 pawn. But look a little further. If he plays bishop b8 in this type of game, then I can play d6, and suddenly his bishop is completely dead, and my bishop is completely alive. If he doesn't move that bishop, then I can take it whenever I want. And I can also make the maneuver knight d4 to b5 whenever I want. His queen would have to move, and then I can play d6. So when evaluating this position, you have to look at not only what the position is and what the structure is, but what it will inevitably become. In many chess positions, we can see that because of certain tactical or positional realities, certain events will definitely unfold. This is such a situation. So in this position, it might look like my bishop is bad and his bishop is good. Inevitably, this position will arise. And here, I'm sure you can see that black's in big trouble. My knight cannot be dislodged. I have tremendous pressure on his e7 and c7 squares. I can even play knight c7 if I want to, if he ever challenges my e-file. If his rook moves off f8 to e8, his f7 pawn becomes very weak. Black's game is on the edge. So now that we see that after the trade of my dark square bishop for his light square bishop, I'll be able to take his bishop whenever I want with my knight, then repeat my other knight to b5 and play d6, and black will be in big trouble. We can see that I want to make that trade. How can I do that? Well, I'm sure you see that I have a discovered attack. I played bishop b6. Bishop g5 was also possible, but for very complicated reasons. Why is bishop g5 more complicated? Because after h takes g5, I can't play the immediate rook takes e4. What does black do now? Here he has bishop f4. Skewer. My queen has to move and he takes on c1. I lose the exchange. I'm in trouble. And of course, the reason that we would calculate bishop g5 is because after bishop b6, queen takes b6, his pawn structure remains the same and we make the trade. But after bishop g5, he's compromising his structure. h takes g5. The reason I can do it is because I can play here knight takes d6 first. The in-between move. Here he has lots of options. He can tactically try to make rook takes c4 work. He can play queen takes d6, simply take back. Or he can play bishop takes f3. We have to look at them all quickly. If he tries to play rook takes c4, of course the idea being he wants to play bishop takes f3 next and he's getting out of the attack of my knight, then I can have a better game after b takes c4. Notice, of course, if he takes back my knight, then I simply take his bishop and I'm up the exchange and winning. Bishop takes f3. Knight takes b7, attacking his queen. He plays queen b6. And now I play the very strong queen e3. By doing this, I'm going to take back the bishop but not with the pawn. After g takes f3, my pawn structure is a wreck. So I play queen e3. And after queen takes b7, queen takes f3. So now he has two knights for a rook and a pawn, but truth be told, black's position is very bad, because my d5 and c4 pawns are tremendously strong. White is better here. If he tries to play bishop takes f3 right away, then I play knight takes c8. Here he tries another in-between move bishop to g2. Quick question. If here he plays queen takes c8, what would you do? Obviously, I want to take back the bishop on f3, but how would you do it? The immediate response might be g takes f3, but now I can run into trouble after queen takes h3, followed by knight f4, or knight h4, a big attack for black. But here I have the simple move, bishop e2, opening up yet another discovered attack on his queen. My next move will be bishop takes f3, and off in exchange, my pawn structure is fine. White is winning. So after knight takes c8, he has to try the in-between move, bishop takes g2. And now I can play king takes g2, and my position will be very good. But he can throw a knight f4 check, which is a little dangerous. So my best move would be to play another in-between move, knight e7 check. And after knight takes e7, queen takes g5. I'm attacking two pieces, so I'm definitely going to get one of them back, and I haven't weakened my king. After bishop takes d5, queen takes e7, we can see that white's up in exchange for a pawn. Black's in trouble. So it's amazing how in calculating a position where we have the option of bishop g5 or bishop b6, and if we choose bishop g5, just to mess up his pawn structure a little bit, we have to analyze all these extra variations. But that's what chess is like gradual mounting tension, and then when things explode, they really explode. And what's very interesting is that for strong players, there's a constant awareness of all the complications which could arise. There's seeing the position in its tranquility, and at the same time knowing that chaos is just around the corner, and that contributes to all the tension in the game. A weaker player can look at a position and think that it's completely calm. A stronger player can look at a position and see that at the moment things are quiet, but that they can explode into chaos any second. So in some ways, the more you see, the more tension you are aware of. And a counterforce to that is that the stronger you are, the more tension you are used to handling, the more you can deal with. So now, after bishop g5, we see that the other two tactics don't quite work. And if he plays simply queen takes d6, recapturing, 
Then rook takes e4. Now his pawn on g5 is weak. He can still try this interesting idea of b5 to undermine my d5 point. But here I win a pawn. Bishop takes b5. Rook takes c1. Queen takes c1. Queen takes d5. It looks like things have simplified. But here I have the very strong move queen c4. And strangely enough, I win the g5 pawn by force. If he plays queen d1 check, of course I can just play rook e1, go back with tempo and defend. And if he trades, queen takes c4, bishop takes c4. His f7 pawn is pinned, so it can't play up to f6. My next move will be knight takes g5. There's no way for black to defend the pawn, and I'll win it. So that was one possibility. I played the other. Notice once again the theme of the cat and the mouse from the introduction. In the last position, his bishop was on f5. He himself played bishop e4, which opened up the possibility for me of trading off these two pieces. It was the pressure that made him twitch. It was the pressure that made him have to do something. Not because he was wrong psychologically so much, as his position was impossible to play without doing something. He had to make a move, and bishop e4 opened up a sea of possibilities for me. The same thing happened before with queen d6. So after bishop e4, I had two options again. One was to play bishop g5, like we just analyzed for a long time. The other was to play bishop b6. I played bishop b6. He took, and now I took back. Now there's a real plus side to this possibility as well. Remember the idea of tension. After bishop g5, after he took back, I was forced to immediately take his bishop. That's not necessary here. I can make the trade and maintain that tension, knowing that I can take the bishop when I want to if it stays there. Kaidanov is a very strong player, and of course he saw my idea to play knight d4, to take his bishop, and when he takes back, to play knight b5, and when his queen moves, to play d6. That's my plan. He had a real sense of urgency here, and he played rook c5. That's a direct prophylactic move against my plan. Why? Well, his idea is, first of all, he's attacking my knight. If I play knight d4, then I'm giving up my queen's defense of the d5 point, and his knight can take it. If I play knight takes d6, then after queen takes d6, knight d4, his rook on c5 is now attacking the d5 point, and he can play knight takes d5. So he saw my plan, and he simply stopped it. But think of the theme of, again, of cat and mouse, of using the opponent's energy against them. So he played rook c5, no problem. I simply go back, knight c3. I defend my pawn, so I respond to his idea, and I have an idea of my own to play knight a4. His queen and rook are awkwardly placed, and my knight on c3 will force them to move. And now I have a new idea, to bring my other knight to b5, knight f3 to d4 to b5, and then I can make this trade, knight takes d6, followed by knight to b5 and d6. So I have a lot of pressure on his position, and I'm being very flexible with the ideas. After knight c3, my threat was the fork, so he went back to d8, the ones responding to my idea and maintaining an indirect attack on the d5 point. White's a move. What do you do now? So remember, how we began this game was by improving our position with rook ac1 and then rook fte1, gradual slow moves. As we've gone on in this discussion, I've shown you that all of the quiet moves were based on very long tactical justifications. Now we have this position. It's time for the quiet move. White to play. What do you do? You can see that my rooks are much better than his. My rooks are both doing things. His rook on c5 is doing something, but his other rook on f8 is doing nothing. If he could have the chance, he would play rook e8. And remember the idea, first of all, is that when you have a spatial disadvantage, when you're being cramped, you want to trade material. Also, my rook on e4 was very strong. His rook on f8 was doing nothing. All those considerations combined for me to play simply rook c to e1, preventing rook e8, doubling up on the e-file, preparing the assault. Here he played queen d7. He needs to bring his last piece into the game. After queen d7, he can play either rook d8 or rook c8 next, doing something with that rook. Now, what was our idea? Bring the other knight into the game, knight d4. Now, if his plan had been to play rook f to c8, then my last move sort of discouraged it, because his rook on c5 is going to be very dangerous. If I play, for example, knight d to b5, at one point, when I hold that b5 point again after knight a4, his rook on c5 will be trapped. He was wary of that. His rook on c5 can never really help to take this d5 point now, because since I've shown that my f3 knight is what's coming to b5, my knight on c3 isn't moving, d5 is solid as a rock. He played rook c to c8, got it out of the way. Now his plan is to play rook f to e8 again. He wants to trade off the rooks in the e-file. He's trying to relieve the pressure on his game. So if his idea is to play rook f to e8, and you know what our plan with white is, maintain the tension, improve your game with white, and stop his idea. What do you do? Knight d to b5, as planned. Do you see why he can't play rook e8? 
Now his queen is overloaded. If rook f to e8, I simply take everything. Rook takes e8, rook takes e8, rook takes e8, queen takes e8, and now the bishop is no longer defended, knight takes d6, and I win a piece. So I improved my game and stopped all of his ideas. And now we reached a position where black simply had nothing to do. He didn't know what to do. If he moves his rook on f8, say to d8, then I can just play knight takes d6, and after everything happens, queen takes d6, knight b5, and the queen moves again, and I play d6, his rook on d8 wishes now that it was back on f8 because my bishop is pressuring that f7 point. He'll have to go back to f8, so that doesn't help his position at all. I stopped his idea of rook to e8, so now I try to go back to his last plan, rook to c5. You can see how noticing every little subtlety of your opponent's play and stopping them from doing what they want to do can allow you to improve your position and force him to just go back and forth, back and forth. Really take a moment and think, white to move, what do you do? What did you come up with? What is the theme of this game? Maintaining the tension, forcing your opponent to twitch, only firing when the shot is clear. Here you may have had the instinct, okay, fine, now we finally reach the moment to do what we want to do, which is true. You could play knight takes d6, queen takes d6, and knight b5. Force the queen to move, play d6. It's very good for white, but you have better. Black has shown that he can't do anything, that he's just going back and forth. Take a moment, see how you can improve your position just a little bit more. Here I maintained all the tension in the position. I left all of my tactics hanging in the air, and I expanded on the king side a little bit. h4. A very strong move. All of my plans have been focused on the queen side, but now the point is that his knight on g6 is going to get kicked back. If I play h5 and he goes back to e7, then I'll win a piece, because knight takes d6, queen takes d6, removing the defender, followed by rook takes e7, and I win. If he doesn't move anything and I play h5 next, his knight's going to have to go back to h8, which is just a horrific square. It's like he's down a piece. So h4 increases the pressure and forces him to deal with another issue. Throw one more ball into the juggler's chaos. He played rook d8. Remember, this is sort of what we want. The f7 square will be very weak later. Now white to play. What do you do? Now this is a very interesting psychological moment for a different reason. I've been describing the idea of maintain the tension, maintain the tension, maintain the tension. But there's an inherent danger in getting caught up in the psychology of maintaining the tension, which is that when the moment comes to make the decisive thrust, we might be so caught up in gradual improvement that we miss the blow. And here, that's just what happened. We were edging time control. My opponent was in a little more time pressure than I was. And I knew that psychologically it's very, very, very hard to hold all the balls in the air when you're being pressured in the way that Gregory was being pressured. So I missed the opportunity to win material by force here. You see what it is? Here I could have played knight takes d6, queen takes d6. Whenever you see a queen and a rook lined up like this, diagonally apart, right next to each other, always know that there's a fork in the air. If my knight were where his rook is, I'd win the exchange. So now I could force that. Rook e8 check, rook takes e8, rook takes e8, king h7. And now after knight e4, I threaten queen and rook. True, he can attack my rook, but after knight takes c5, queen takes e8. Here I can play knight takes b7. And white is completely winning, because not only do I win the one pawn, but I win the other pawn on a5. Next I'll play d6. Black's in big trouble. So inherent in the idea of maintaining the tension is the idea of presence. Be present in the moment. If you have a chance to make a decisive thrust, you have to catch that moment. Here I was very caught up in the idea of gradually mounting the pressure, and I missed this decisive idea. But my position is still tremendous, and I can increase the pressure like I did. h5. He goes back to f8. We know that knight e7 is bad because I take on d6 and then take on e7. And after knight f8, I continued with queen e2, taking complete control of the e-file, being prepared to take on d6 whenever I want. If his bishop moves now, then rook e7 will be completely destructive. And now I'm preparing a kingside assault. He played queen f5, inherent in the idea of the cat and the mouse using the opponent's twitch against him, is noticing all the little changes in the position as they occur. Now here I used his queen being up on the square like f5 against him. What would you do with white? Now the moment has come. I played knight takes d6, rook takes d6, and here I utilized the fact that he's left the back rank completely behind, and I played rook e8. Notice that here again I had a similar idea to the one that I described before with the fork. I could have played rook e5, forcing his queen to move, and after queen c2, knight e4, forking the two rooks. Then he can play queen takes e2, rook takes e2, rook c takes d5, and after knight takes d6, rook takes d6, rook e7. 
I'm up in exchange, I'm pressuring his f7 point. Obviously my game is winning. This would have been very strong, but what I did was very effective as well. After rook e8, he has big back rank problems. Of course, my threat is queen e7, attacking f8, winning the game. He had to play rook c8, and now I went after the queen, rook e5. He played queen f4. Notice that his queen is running out of squares. g3. His queen only has one square now, f6. His queen is in the center, but for all sorts of tactical reasons, he has nothing else. For example, if queen d4, then knight b5 wins the exchange. He runs into a fork. After queen f6, I went back to the old plan, knight b5, rook d7, d6. Black is in huge trouble. Position is getting squashed. So now he tried to dislodge my rook, knight c6. So you flow with it, no problem. Rook e4. Now my plan is to play rook f4, go after the f7 point. Here he played rook cd8, adding a little pressure to the d6 point and hoping to sacrifice that exchange somehow and alleviate some of the pressure. Rook f4, attacking the queen, aiming at f7, queen g5. Now what do you do? We have to flow with every little change of the position. My pawn on d6 is very strong. My knight on b5 holds it. You might think of my knight on b5 as something which should not and cannot move. But black has other problems. His queen on g5 is almost trapped. I played knight c3. Black's position is right on the edge of falling apart. If he plays rook takes d6, I play knight e4, win the exchange. Notice, of course, that if he doesn't play rook takes d6, the knight e4 is going to be very strong. His queen will only have the e5 square. Here he tried to figure out a way to give his queen a little more breathing room. Queen c5. Now I played knight e4. Notice my knight was once defending the pawn from b5, now from e4, which is very strong centrally and also eyeing the king side. He played queen b4. White's a move, what do you do? Now I wanted to attack. I was ready to aim for the king side. Once again, I want you to feel the theme of letting your opponent's reaction to the tension be decisive in your decision as to how to convert your advantage. His queen was in the king's side. Now it's on the queen's side. Our knight was on the queen's side. Now it's on the king's side. Still we have the pawn on d6. Still all of his pieces are locked down. Now it's time to attack. But how do you attack? Remember, we know we don't just run forward. You might think that you want to win black's queen with knight f6 check, g takes f6, bishop takes f7 check. Two discoveries to win the queen. It's true, you can win the queen, but at too big an expense. After he takes back the bishop, after rook takes queen, and then black takes back with the knight, say, you've given up two pieces and a rook for a queen. That means that black will be a material. Definitely not what we want to do. Just take a moment for white again. What would you do? I prepared the attack with a quiet move. Queen e3. So if it were white's move again, do you see what my idea was? My threat is knight f6 check. Not to win the queen, but to mate him. Of course, if his king moves, I simply take the rook. And after g takes f6, my plan is rook g4 check. If his king moves to h8, queen takes h6 check. And then after knight h7, queen g7 will be mate. If his king goes to h7, then I play bishop d3 check. Now, of course, if king back to h8, I take the queen. Notice if I opened up my rook's attack on his queen, his only move is knight g6, after which I can take that. Then I can take back again, then I can take his queen, I can mate him, everything falls apart for black. And if after rook g4 check, he plays knight g6, what do you do with white? Mate in two. I don't take back with the pawn, but I utilize the pin, take back with the rook. The f7 pawn can't take my rook because of the pin to the king. And if after either king f8, king h8, or king h7, queen takes, it, queen takes h6, will be mate. So after queen e3, I'm prepared for knight f6 check. He stopped it, king h8. Here we feel once more the power of potential. My attack never actually happened. It was on the edge of happening, and he had to stop it. And I used his concessions to pick off pawns to win the game. After king h8 is defended against the mating attack, but he's given up defense of the f7 pawn. I simply take it. Bishop takes f7. Now I've opened up my knight to a discovery against his queen. What is he going to do? He got out of the way. Queen b5. Now here I brought my bishop back, bishop c4. I also had the very unusual idea of knight c3, attacking his queen, and when his queen moves to g5, white to move. Try to find my idea. Here I would have the painfully unusual bishop to e8, at once attacking his rook on d7, and blocking his other rook's defense of the f8 square. So after rook takes d6, rook takes f8, 
will win a piece. After I played bishop c4, he played queen e5. Now white's move. What do you do? Now it's time for me to win the exchange. Knight c5. Again, utilizing the ideas of forks. I'm attacking his rook on d7 and opening up our queens to one another. If he plays queen takes e3, then after f takes e3, rook takes d6, I simply play knight takes b7, forking his two rooks, I'll take one, I'll be up not only the exchange, but an exchange and a pawn, completely winning. Black can resign. After knight c5, he played queen takes d6, I took the exchange, knight takes d7, queen takes d7. Now we all know what to do when ahead. We trade material, or prepare to trade material, and keep the bind. Rook e4, preparing rook e8. He'll have no way to defend the f8 knight. His position is completely bound down, he's down in exchange. And now the game ends on an appropriate note. Black has too much pressure on his position one last time. He has to play knight d4, desperately trying to do something. And now I played a tactic which took advantage of his last move. What did I do? The cat jumping on the mouse one last time. Rook takes d4. Queen takes d4. Queen takes d4. Rook takes d4. And now after rook e8, he can't defend the knight. I win a piece, and he resigned. So when you think about this game, remember the tension on the board and in the players' minds. Every time that Gregory did something, I found the flaw in that last move and took a little advantage of it. And step by step, very, very gradually, my position got better and better and better. And the stakes got higher and higher. So in the beginning, I was simply improving a little bit, gaining a little time, playing a move like knight b5, playing a move like giving up my pawn and playing d5, slowly increasing my space. But after a while, at the very end, the way I took advantage of his mistakes was by winning material. And this is how chess works. This is technique at the high level. Notice every little twitch of your opponent and take advantage of it.